So hi, um, I'm uh, Vincent Zimmer, part two, I'm presenting with uh, my colleague Giri Mudasuru, and we're going to talk about FSP 2.0. So like with uh, Lee this morning, I'm going to sort of intro, and then Giri's going to sort of spiral into the details. So what was um, the intent of Intel FSP, and what are we doing here? So the idea is this is an effort to encapsulate um, silicon initialization that, you know, very critical, SOC specific, something that, you know, not readily, um, not readily open sourceable for IP protection or other things that if um, people were to change the code, you know, bad things might happen. And so essentially, FSP is a um, well-defined um, interface to a binary that you can include in many different environments. It has an API set, um, some interface code, and it has support for different um, parts of the SOC, like in this picture, the CPU, system agent, PCH. And the real point is allowing us to work with a lot of different um, communities, whether it's um, a Chromebook with um, Core Boot, where ROM stage will orchestrate interaction with the Intel FSP, or an EDK2 style BIOS, where a lot of what's historically been the PEI phase will be subsumed in the FSP. Or we've even seen like on the Baytrail Minnow platform, you know, Simon Glass just launched U-Boot x86 directly from FSP. And we think that's great in the sense of want to lower the barrier to have people do development on Intel-based um, Intel platforms. So again, Ease integration, when we say bootloader here, we're talking about the platform firmware, not the first stage OS um, loader, and working with open development communities. So as mentioned, um, FSP has a few external interfaces, Tempram init, FSP uh, memory init, silicon init, and notify with, oh, it's weird, it's uh, sort of chopping off part of the, um, the deck here. Um, the data, is, the input to it is data, um, and then the output are things called handoff blocks, memory-based um, uh, memory data structures. And then, so why did we go to um, FSP 2.0? If you guys recall, in the 2012, circa 2012, there was at Intel FSP. It was predominantly driven by our Internet of Things group. and so one of the challenges was each FSP instance was sort of different for each SOC, so the interface code had to be slightly customized. And so what we observed was, hey, you know, easing development with open communities is great. Let's all work together in, on FSP. So Gary, myself, a lot of guys at Intel, we sort of took the existing FSP model, sort of locked down what were we, we thought would have been architectural or consistent APIs, and we called that FSP 1.0, and then worked with the upstreams to have wrapper code, whether core boot or EDK2, since there was only one interface. And then um, through some product development, so there were some enhancements to FSP, what we called FSP 1.1. And now what the bulk of today's conversation is, is to really explain the intent behind why FSP 2.0. And Andre's talk yesterday he talked a little bit about it. Um, booting from EMMC um, posed one challenge. So the original FSP, what became 1011, had um, memory map structures near the reset vector. Well, what if you have a medium without memory mapped um, execute in place firmware? So there was a sort of an architectural dependency on the preceding FSPs, which, which motivated it. And then some learnings on using FSP. More modularity, um, mentioned this dual FSP. But any security model where you may want to not have, say, memory in it in your read-only block, you may want to dual out um, some of the silicon flows and then size um, inherent in that if you don't want to duplicate everything. Um, having each component with its own configuration data and then um, some more reset flexibility. So what we believe is, you know, we built the first one, worked with the community, found issues, evolved the spec, 
in 1-1 one, one where we ironed out some of those issues. And then 2-0, we observed these physics problems like the non-memory mapped boot. And again, building things. So sort of as we've evolved the 1-0 to 1-1 to 2-0, we've seen platform instances in the open. A lot of great um, examples, a couple Chromebooks. We have a couple EDK2 solutions based on 1-1. And now with upcoming silicon, you're going to see more 2-0. And uh, speaking of silicon, I'm sort of, I work in a software group at Intel. We sort of work with um, IoT client server. So I do software, but when it gets down to the details of hardware and the magic that's going on, we have experts like Geary, who's sort of the lead for um, our client silicon and firmware. And he's gonna walk you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Vincent. Um, so as Vincent started the FSP Toronto Primarily, it started as an extension. How do we support uh, the non-memory mapped boot devices like the MMC? And as we started there, uh, we also looked for things that we have learned during the 1.1 implementation. Uh, as Vincent mentioned, 1.0 versus 1.1 is 1.0 was the implementations, the embedded group, the IoTG side implemented. We locked that spec. We work with Google and try to uh, see how we can make it uh, fit into this Google core boot as an example and also make it linear flow. Uh, we'll talk in the boot flow about what the linear flow, why we did 1.1 and made it flexible for the bootloader to do some of the stuff, in this case, core, core boot. Um, we also added the key thing is the reset flexibility. Uh, this is part of the learning and the, before that the data, static data, which is built into the FSP also uh, split into various components. So um, here is a um, high level layout, how the 1.0 and 2.0, I'll walk through them. So if you see the first like 1.0 or 1.1, pretty much it's defined as the five APIs as uh, we saw in the previous slide. And each phase I'll just quickly walk through the time prime The primary uh, scope for it is to bring up the cache SRAM and do any early silicon initialization as part of that. So here the naming of that is more of a phases. That's the bring up of the temporary RAM phase. Um, in certain cases, like if you have a silicon with SRAM available, you may not need uh, to even use that phase, but that can be considered as more as a early silicon phase where you need to do switching the processor modes and other things. The second one is the FSP memory init, which is the memory initialization or memory bring up phase, which is where we go, the DRAM init, detect and all the initialization happens. The primary goal of that phase is bring up the memory. Uh, it does more than that. Uh, for certain reasons is like if you have to do certain programming before you lock certain registers or you need uh, to determine which features to be enabled, how the memory layout or allocation needs to happen. Um, but the exit of that will be primarily is memory up and running and the interfaces and reports the memory status uh, out through the hubs to the bootloader. And the temporary exit is if you enable the temporary initialization cache SRAM, that is where we just tear off that cache SRAM. And silicon in it is the rest of the silicon initialization that needs to be done. Here it is um, the uncore or the system agent features or the PCH IO features or bring up the uh, boot devices and other things. And notify phase is where we leave certain things like the post PCA bus enumeration. There are three calls within that post PCA bus enumeration and also ready to boot event. And we added one more called end of firmware. At these three, where we lock certain registers or make sure that the chipset for security reasons and all other things, which we cannot lock prior to that because we want the bootloader to do whatever it needs to do and leave that flexibility along that. And those uh, certain register lockings will be um, done as part of the silicon requirements, not necessary from architecture, it's the placeholders. Um, if we can lock everything and there is no impact to the bootloader, we could do it as early as possible. Too. And the, when we started with that is the 1.1, we extended that uh, the three FSP memory in it, temporary in it, and silicon in it, in the FSP 1.0 implementation, everything was FSP in it, one API. We broke it down to give more flexibility for the bootloader and make it linear operation. and. That's part of the uh, engagement we work with uh, Aaron and Duncan, 
to make sure that how we can make it a linear flow and also flexible for the bootloader to do certain stuff. And as part of the implementation in the ROM stage, RAM stage, and the Google's uh, Chrome read-only model, uh, in the implementation without changing the architecture, so the 1.1 is pretty much the usage model. We internally split that into two. Uh, here we call FVs, which is a firmware volumes, which is internally two separate binaries, still packaged as one FSP, so that uh, the memory FV is executed in the ROM stage, which contains the temporary init and memory init in that case. And the silicon FV is the one which will be in the updatable code. So you have the single FSP, but uh, technically you have two FSPs. One piece of it is launched from the ROM stage, and you can use the other one from this uh, based on the manufacturing mode or in the updatable mode. So we took those learnings and instead of just being a use case of that, uh, of the FSP 1.1, we made it architectural and also make it a flexible in the 2.0 while uh, trying to solve the uh, non-memory map boot model. Essentially group those into three different architecturally FSP 2.0 compliant uh, image is technically three binaries padded together. We'll still distribute as a single binary but uh, there is a, a Python script we uh, have already in the open source. So you can use that to split into three different binaries. And you get the flexibility of instead of having like everything rebased in one location, based on the tempram phase could be run in the SRAM. And the uh, memory code could be run in the cache SRAM while you are doing it. And the silicon code could be run from this. So you can while you can do it post rebase or while building it, you can rebase at different addresses in your memory map. You have that flexibility with the 2.0. So that's what the primary is. As you can see, the APIs are pretty much similar. It's more about how do we package that contents and make sure we give that flexibility. So here is the 2.0 boot flow. Um, you can see in the representation that these are three individual binaries represented within the central uh, FSP as a package. Uh, the key change from 1.1 to 2.0 is the uh, FSP, if it needs certain things to be reset, if it finds something not configured properly, if it has to unlock or if it is locked and need to unlock, FSP used to trigger the reset, which was uh, limiting the bootloader if it has to do some housekeeping like sending an EC command or doing something at a platform level. So we started initially as maybe we'll give a flexibility for the bootloader, then the bootloader calls back into the FSP for doing the reset. Um, then we ended up just, FSP will return if it needs a reset, it will return, hey, uh, we are exiting this with a reset status, and uh, the bootloader will read that and perform the reset sequence instead of uh, putting everything in the binary blob because reset is pretty much there. Uh, reset could be customized based on SOCs, but uh, we uh, will be uh, defining that as part of the integration guide, what bootloader needs to do with specific types of resets. Uh, other than that, the boot flow is pretty much linear flow. Uh, the bootloader starts, and bootloader is the one which starts at reset vector. Um, treat this as individual three pieces of silicon initialization code delivered along with the silicon. Uh, which should be uh, independent of any platform configuration or the usage. Uh, the primary scope and goal of that is how do we build a, if we, if you are using a silicon, if the FSP is meant to be that silicon initialization code, which should not limit you if you can build a platform around it, this still should meet your requirements and bootloader should have all the flexibility. Any questions? Maybe I can pause here. Yes. Are any parts of this optional? Yes, that's a good point. So as part of the FSP 2.0, we also made the Tempra Minute and the Tempra Exit APIs as optional uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, there is a drive from the Google Core Boot implementation that uh, the Tempra Exit and init code, because it's pretty much generic, right? Bring up and tearing of the cache SRAM. Uh, those can be implemented in public uh, in the core boot bootloader itself without using this. Or uh, in the future, if you have enough SRAM available in the silicon itself, then these APIs could be optional. So considering those two use cases, 
we defined those two APIs as optional. And uh, based on the, that's what we put it as an architectural in this spec itself that based on the implementation, these two APIs can be optional. And if it is optional, uh, we have handled that uh, in the, how do we call the rest of the APIs that's part of the define in this spec itself. So, We'll quickly walk through the key changes, not necessarily getting into details, but uh, the FSP info header, uh, which is the uh, key information which you hold in the binary. Uh, the parsing of the FSP is pretty much uh, same as the uh, FSP 1.1. Uh, the only difference, which I didn't capture in these slides, but uh, the difference is in the earlier FSP implementation, the FSP info header is present in the bottom of the image or the starting of the image. And in this case, each component, as we described, the T, M, and S, the three phases, uh, each will carry its own uh, info header. So that means you can treat each one as independent FSP binaries. And the header, info header, will describe whether it is a, which phase of which component is it. So, and the changes are we added a new uh, field of our spec revision. Earlier in the 1.x implementations, we had uh, the FSP header revision overloaded with also the spec that is version one is one and version two is 1.1 spec and we tried to do the same like version three is like fsp 2.0 and we got a feedback from aaron uh that seems to be confusing because it's not like it's confusing like what header three is like fsp spec 2.0 so we defined a spec version field which is a bcd value which will at least uh, give the major and minor version of the spec uh, so that it's obvious and it's clear uh, if you have to read it from the runtime or using tools. And also uh, the header revision is updated and image attribute, we had image attribute which was used only for the GOP support, like whether FSP supports the graphics or display bring up or not, internal graphics. And we had, that's, that was only one in the 32 bit. So we reduced that to a word and defined a component attribute in the other word, uh, which will indicate the types of in the use cases, like whether it's a debug FSP or a release version, and also whether it is a uh, official release versus a engineering test builds, because in this way, at least when you get a binary, it could be easily identified by the binary itself and not necessarily have to go through or figure it out some other way. Um, and we also define the uh, component types. This is how you uh, identify whether if you split into three binaries, then you can using this component type, you can identify whether you're uh, T, M, or S. And we also defined a O called OEM. So if you have some data or something you want to add to this and distribute it, it's a distribution mechanism also. Primarily FSP, right? It serves two purposes. One, we started as an IP container, so to enable the open source enabling model. The second one is also uh, simplify the enabling process. So if you have a silicon and a board, and if you have a socket compatible next generation of socket, so ideally you swap the FSP. If the APIs are all same, the configuration data matches, you should be able to bring up a new silicon without changing uh, a lot in the uh, board level or platform level usages. And uh, FSP in it, this is the 1.0 API, and we made it uh, reserved and make it zero. And this is one of the reasons it's FSP 2.0 instead of 1.2, because we broke the compatibility with the 1.x uh, uh, APIs. So uh, here is from the API wise, you can see some uh, clarification and corrections and simplified this. Uh, the primary one is Tempra init instead of the custom structures, we just made a data pointer, which is the parameters required uh, to uh, configure the Tempra initialization. These structures will be defined in the integration guide and based on the implementation of the silicon and uh, that is expected to change. That's why we use the void and the second case in the memory in it, it had a structure and that structure had a few things, the hub output, the NVS parameters and other things. What we did here is to simplify that, we took the data as it is, which is the input for that, the data parameterization. And also uh, the output is a hub list pointer. Hub is a simple data structure as Vincent mentioned in the memory, which is a gridded. So it has a grid 
and it has a uh, so you can identify the data structure type and uh, that's uniquely identifies it so hub is a terminology from the pi spec uh, but it's nothing but a data structure with a grid and a defined structure header and uh, the tempra minute and also we said the input output because it's only input because the outputs are all hubs so it's kind of correcting the earlier 1.x spec and clarifications um, And this is the FSP UPD header. Uh, the data is the uh, parameterization data, the signature revision, and we reserve a few bits for future if we need to. But it's pretty much a standard header you'll find on the, each of the phases, the T phase, M phase, and S phase. That's the structure header. It starts with a signature, and the signature, what the signature value is, will be in the integration guide. Um, and you can see each of the phases basically it has a header and followed by the custom parameters and uh, for the uh, memory phase we also defined a architectural upd that is pretty much a spec defined uh, upd parameters which will be consistent across every generation or every implementation and that is the details what are these and the two things we added stack base and stack size is for making the tempra minute optional phase because whether FSP initializes the temprime or the bootloader initializes the temprime, this phase needs to know what is the temporary memory FSP can consume and use. And the size of it will be defined in the integration guide. Uh, but other than that, NVS buffer pointer is the S3 data, which FSP will pass in the previous boot, bootloader will save and pass it back through this. And uh, bootloader tollum size is for the CBMEM allocations, or if you want a custom memory carved out of the memory allocation, uh, that's the one. So here is the SDK or this development kit of FSP. So if you are trying to build a FSP or generate a FSP, uh, these are the packages and package is kind of a folder with a defined structure in the PI spec, uh, which is just additional declaration and the APIs are defined clearly. So these are the things which are required, like base tools for all the EDK build tools and environment like uh, Lee and Vincent this morning, they talked about um, the MDE, MDE module package. Uh, it's basically uh, the industry spec defined interfaces or UFI defined interfaces like hubs, the PI spec or PCI or ACPI, those things. I mean, even though we don't use ACPI, but all those industry standard definitions and certain implementations, libraries, common libraries, you can call it, those are part of it. And Intel FSP2 package is where the uh, FSP implementations and this FSP2 package is the new one for FSP2.0. For the 1.x, there is an Intel FSP package. Both are there. And in this case, we're talking about FSP2.0. So we just listed the FSP2.0 SDK, what you need to build FSP. Uh, UEFI CPU package is basically the CPU initialization. Uh, it's beyond Intel. The ARM also is supported as part of that. Whatever the UEFI spec defines the CPU architectures. In this case, the Intel X86, uh, whatever is defined, it publicly available in the SDM, the software development manual. Uh, those encoding like the MP initialization, certain feature initialization. So we're trying to add more and more silicon initialization, which is publicly available content, the CPU initialization as part of that UFI CPU package. That's the new one, which is added as part of the current implementations so that we can do more and uh, open source. Uh, the Intel Silicon package is a concept. There is already a review in the public, and the intention of that is any public specs we can in the Intel, Intel Silicon initialization, which is publicly available, and we can publicly post the code, uh, we could add it as part of that. The first one we started is the simple IGD op region. This morning conversation came is one of the first targets we are adding, like simple interface definitions versus implementations in future. Um, so that package doesn't exist as of today. It will be in a few weeks. Uh, what will be there? And the rest is the actual silicon package, which is, let's say, the Skylake as an example. Whatever the Skylake specific imp implementation, like memory initialization or a few other things which are generation specific, uh, that will go into that SOC silicon package. And that FSP package is more of the glue code, which translates the FSP APIs into the silicon initialization. So today, uh, what we have is all the below 
four, five, six packages actually. But uh, whatever you see in the like green is already publicly available. Those are the two pieces, which is proprietary, of course. MRC is part of that blue piece. And our goal is to, how do we minimize that content and put more into whatever we can publicly. Even though the FSP as a binary is today uh, private and uh, under IP, but most of the content is uh, used, majority of the content is from used from the reused from the open source. And in the upcoming like cable generation, all the CPU initialization or majority of it is from the SDM based UFI CPU package. Uh, and what will be distributed along with the FSP is the standard, the binary will be distributed and these, the UPD.h files for all phases is the configuration and data structures, which are SOC specific. And the integration guide will put together all of this and the details of the policies. And we have got a lot of feedback, thanks to Aaron specifically for giving detailed feedback and hopingly, uh, we're hoping that it's more usable than yesterday. Tomorrow will be much better than today. Um, but BSF file is the boot settings file, which is if you are using a tool like the um, BCT, the binary configuration tool, FSP contains the static data. So if you want to use that static data to configure the static data within the FSP image, you can use this file as part of the tool. So you can use it through GUI based. And that spec is also published uh, a month back publicly. So the BSF spec is public now. And if there is additional things like GPIO structures and other things uh, will be provided as part of the sample or reference as needed along with the distribution of the FSP. So uh, here is kind of a high level summary of the FSP various implementations and where we are. So 1.0 had, I mean, these are a few examples of what is 1.0 based implementations. You can see, uh, I'll use the code names, Broadwell, Baytrail, all these things. Uh, these are primarily the IOTG defined and they were uh, productizing it for a while. Uh, so the first version of FSP was from Ivy Bridge, which is third generation of or even second generation. So FSP is there for a while, so it's not new, uh, but it was primarily created for IOTG and embedded segment primarily to simplify the use cases. And with the Chromebook uh, implementation, we try to bring it into the client mainst mainstream right now. And we are doing the 1.1, we did a uh, Skylake and Braswell. Both of them are implemented in the Chromebooks uh, from uh, the sixth generation and this and the, with the 1.1 APIs. And the next generation, which is KB Lake follow on to Skylake and Apollo Lake, will be using the FSP 2.0. And our goal is since this FSP, Vincent and I co chair the FSP working group at Intel. So it's not just a client or a uh, specific segment specific anymore. Uh, we made it an Intel wide spec and make sure that uh, maybe in future we'll have the other segments like servers joining this. So if they are productizing it, that will be based on 2.0 going forward. So we're all aligned on 2.0. So 1.1 is in more maintenance phase and 1.0 is pretty much a legacy and trying to be sustaining phase. And all these images and details are there in intel.com FSP. Uh, you can find the detailed links and other things. So what we are looking is, again, these are like our plans and direction visions. So it's fully, so we're driving towards that. You can see the trend, how we are trying to do is, uh, first step is like all the FSP binaries we heard for, uh, from the community also is like, why are we doing it through the web base? So you have to click through licenses and all to download FSP image and all. So first thing is we are trying to change that to just have a Git repo so we can post this and you can pull them the latest versions and sync from them directly. Avoid that web based link or manually maintain somewhere else. And uh, the second one is the continue to increase the open source content inside FSP binary. And our goal is not necessary FSP as a big binary black magic where we want to do everything. Uh, we're trying to do is, yes, FSP is a package mechanism to deliver, but how do we minimize, but that doesn't mean we can't open source FSP. And Quark is an example, Lee and team already did is, 
even if you have a full open source, FSP doesn't mean that you can't open source. Open source or not is primarily driven by business, IP, legal, all these things. From a technical standpoint, FSP is a mechanism of how we deliver it. It's a silicon initialization binary. And in future, the second one is trying to see is the SDK we showed earlier, can we make it publicly available, maybe limit the IP portions like memory initialization as the small binary within that, but you can generate your FSP publicly. If you have to rebuild for debug purposes and everything. Um, that's where we want to limit the binary size and footprints. And in that way, it's not entirely like FSP glue code. If you see, there is nothing except for UPDs translating to initializing the silicon data structures inside. So it has no IP there. Uh, but how do we get there is we're trying to do step by step, making sure we're uh, not missing anything. These two are the examples where we took that first step of open source content heavily used in the KB Lake timeframe. You'll see that UFI CPU package, which is already public and being there. So we're adding more and more content uh, instead of the basic thing, what was there, we're adding more and like the Sky Lake generation, the MP initialization, we're already using it. We are adding more features like SGX and other things which are publicly available as part of the data sheets. Uh, we can initialize them and consume them. Uh, here are the GitHub URLs if you are looking for those packages where they are. And all of them are in the GitHub, TNA Core EDK2, and uh, the FSP, uh, FSP2 package. And this is the tool I mentioned about which you can use to split it up. But we also added a capability to rebase it. So Aaron, in the past, we need a BCT tool to rebase it. Uh, we enabled, uh, extended this tool to support rebasing. So you don't need a BCT, but you can do the rebasing using simple. BCT is primarily now you can do rebase, but also you can do static configuration. But if you just need to rebase to a different address post build, you can simply use this tool and it is already available now. Uh, this is recently added and we enabled that. And these are more the links to that, the homepage, intel.com FSP, you'll find all the links and other things, training videos and other things. Um, we all have the FSP 2.0 spec published and the 1.1a, uh, which is the addendum to that latest one. And this is the BSF spec. We also published that firmware intel.com, uh, which is describes the BSF file, how the syntax and layout is. It's pretty much describing your settings. And BCT tool, uh, both Windows and Linux versions are available in the intel.com to download. And we also have a hashtag. So if you are interested to use Twitter, so you can use that. <laughs> so uh, any questions? And backup, I have the FSB 1.1 boot flows. So you can see the difference if you need to, but sure. Let's see questions. <laughs> so when you were uh, pointing out the headers that are uh, distributed with FSP, there was one uh, FSP uh, TUPD. Yeah. Is that for uh, the Tampram init portion? Yes. yes. So before Tampram init, well, you technically don't have a stack, so you wouldn't have a C code. Uh, what is the purpose of defining an interface in a uh, C header? So when you build a FSP uh, or when you build a bootloader, right, core boot as an example, uh, you need to pass certain parameters like microcode if you want to load a microcode or if you want to say how much size you want to enable or cache certain parameters or things you need to pass it. It is more as a build time, but from FSP, if you consume as a binary, you just a bootloader passes a hard coded, okay, here is the pointer, you link it at build time. But in the cases of SRAM, when you have SRAM, you can run C code there and you can extend it. So basically at this point, it's only a read-only hard-coded stack, you can say. But in future, when we have SRAM and especially in the Apollo Lake, uh, Andre uh, might have uh, described earlier, where you have the SRAM available and you can define based on if you have certain things you want to change on the fly, you can pass them. So it serves two purposes, but it's more as a read-only currently, but we remove that limitation. In future, if you have that, you can use it. You need some data to initialize. That's a microcode as a simple example. Where do you place a microcode? It's bootloader choice. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, do we plan to release debug version FSB to the community? I think right now we're only giving the release view, which basically you cannot debug with it, right? You don't see any logs. Yes, so. so that is, we are working on that to release debug version along with release version. So far, only release versions are posted. So we're trying to post the debug version. From, from KBX, maybe? Yes, so there is discussion going on. Okay. Uh, so it's it's not about that. It's just to make sure that there is the messages are all sanitized. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more. So it's a debug message. Like yeah, it's it's all about like making sure developers didn't put something they shouldn't. <laughs> yes. In the Apollo Lake case, it is read only, and I correct me, uh, it is currently read only. But uh, we are trying to see in the future, at least, if we, we can have behave as a real RAM. So you can read and write. At this point in Apollo Lake implementation, it's just read only for us. Uh, the FSPO uh, yes. space for component type, is that uh, definition that you can define for that really? No, that's meant to be whoever implements it will define it. Let's say uh, if Intel, we define, let's say, in secure FSP case, right? We want to put a hash of the FSP and we want to distribute that. We can define in the FSP O, put a sign it and put it in that O component as an example, right? Or if you want to have a data, static data, you want to package and sign it, you can distribute it. There is no, what it defines is FSP O is it has the info header. And it says FSPO, whoever produces the O owns the APIs, whether it's a simple data or you can have code and APIs. That's just purely uh, as a placeholder to do additional things. Uh, am I allowed to build my own firmware out of it? Question one, is it? Is it complete? Can I build a full working uh, image? And the second would be, am I allowed also to distribute it? Can I put it on my blog, whatever? Uh, maybe you want to take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I can take the first part of the question. Um, here, if you have access today, the silicon and FSP package, the top two packages are under NDA. Uh, so if you have access, you can build it. And, but as we said, the word future direction is we want to make sure that we want to limit those things as binaries. Let's say, say it has also the PA GOP image, the graphics image as a binary inside it. So if you have that binary, you can rebuild the code. So as I mentioned, glue code doesn't have any APIs or anything. It's just, we need to go through the process and make sure that we can, our goal is to make sure you can build it and majority as much as we can still open source it. Uh, the next question. Right, I think the, and this is tease off of what we talked about at lunch, right? So essentially what you want is, this is more a legal license question of, if I grab fsp.bin off the web, mix in my Corbett recipe, and want to post the resultant binary, is that permissible? I believe that's the intent. I'm not a lawyer. I've heard in the past um, the present FSP to click through the end user license agreement, maybe people it wasn't as clear, but the intent is that. But I'm a technical guy, not a lawyer, but the intent is most definitely what you would like to do, which is be able to derive resultant product from this, including full firmware images and redistribute. The whole intent of this program is remove the need to do sign NDAs and other things, grab content off the web, build your product and do with as you will. But I'm not a lawyer. And, and one of the action items we can do if that is a concern is talk to people who know more and about the license specifically the github posting we want to get rid of the click through and put the license.txt next to it such that you can use source control but also talk to the the people who are smarter on licenses and the law to make sure the intent which i expressed just now is truly the case but i believe that is the intent and but we'll we will follow up as part of this git posting to make sure the license.txt appropriately reflects that that is the intent. Oh, 
Uh, Giri, there were questions from the community earlier about postcodes in FSP. Um, yes. What is the plan? Like, are you planning to put so up a document? So postcodes are there and we are defined. I mean, those are captured as part of the integration guide, at least in the KB Lake, as we know. Uh, in the Sky Lake and prior, yeah, we didn't pay attention or we didn't do that as far as, as I said, right? We are improving and getting the feedback what we need to do. <coughs> we also did um, standardize the postcode, at least the 16 bit split into various so you can identify which API you are in and what we are doing on a very high level and within that the details uh, so that at least it's consistent. So you don't have to decode every time looking to integration guard, but at least you could decode where it is. But within, like, let's say if you find a URN memory code, your harm. At least what you are doing when you are hung is the details you may need to look into integration guide, but at least it's easier to say that whether you are hung inside FSP or in the bootloader once we return it or where we are, at least to simplify that debugging. So the postcodes will continue to be enabled. Uh, we are also looking at um, enabling like a uh, cataloging the debug messages to reduce the size. One of the negative side of the debug FSP is the larger size. So it depends on how the firmware is allocated. You may optimize for a release production. You may not fit in the standard firmware problem, right? So if you want more debug, you do that. So what we're trying to do is use the cataloging capability. So at least you encode it during the build process, but you have a um, catalog schema file, which will be, you can decode it at the receiving end. Right, print, you print message one and then one. offline have yeah. decoder to do that. Big string. Yeah. So at least in the release model, if you are doing some timing issues and all, that should really help because debug you may not find or reproduce those issues. So uh, for the this uh, I guess FSP open uh, binaries, are you imagining that? What do you envision the interface uh, if you're building the FSP to the memory unit will be? I guess like uh, let's say that. Uh, I'm. I need some additional uh, parameter to the memory customization that is not uh, brought out through BCT and through the UPD. Um, is you envision that you will try to expose the entire uh, common code reference code interface uh, to memory net, or imagine that that would be an additional wrapper? Or I guess not to find yes yeah. so the question is yes if it is fully open like let's assume the case where it is not ip content right so in right. that case you can technically add your own parameter or extend your parameter to do that okay. full but it won't be a standard so it's just kind of a test version right right if you need that extension i would like to get that request so that we can review that and see if there is the other way of doing it or is it like we really need to add one more parameter to customize to meet your use case, right. and we will add that. Okay. So basically, so if it, everything is open, you can technically add it, but right. still it's not preferred because when you get a next version of FSP, that won't you that will be write. missing. But for test purposes and other things, you can add it. Okay. And we would like to get that request so that we can analyze that and we can make it part of the next releases. So you don't have to do that hacking. Okay. Right. I guess, and I guess if I understand correctly, your thought is that maybe you could allow some sort of building of the FSP and you'd give like the binary for just the memory net code and the wrapper, right? Is yes. That, so. so basically that's what the vision we said, right? The future we want to yeah. see is like you can build FSP, but only the IP container pieces may be the binaries. Right. In the ideal world, like Quark, you don't need any binaries. You can right. build everything from open. But if we can't, because of all the legal stuff, we don't want to stop. That's what we see that the biggest missing piece was we stopped at, oh, we can't open, uh, we can't open up all the silicon initialization. We stopped there, right? Right. So with FSP, what we are trying to do is, okay, let's take the silicon piece away. Let's look at the around things, whatever we need to do to open source it, maybe simple things as GPIOs or reset or SMS right. or other things, or ACPI for that matter, which could be publicly done. Once we take out all those things, then we can focus on the silicon piece. So we are doing both parallelly. Okay. While we bring up the bootloader with core boot and EDK2 parallelly, and the Braswell is an example Vincent and Lee mentioned this morning, is the EDK2 version of the Braswell is also FSP based one is open source now. Right. So we're trying to continue the trend whatever we can when we can. Okay. But 
then continue to focus within FSP is how much we can do open source. That's the UFI CPU package, Intel Silicon package definition. Right, and okay. the hope is keep the FSP just SOC specific memory in it. So hopefully there will be a rich enough set of UPDs, for example, that cover what you want. And if you're doing something okay. really weird and are off the reservation, hoping that's the outlier, right? Make okay. make FSP just what the SOC um, memory controller exposes and all the different permutations on how the board could have been wired up, et cetera. Anything that's system board vendor degree of freedom exposed to things like UPD. And if we got it wrong in some places and we definitely like feedback, let us know. Okay. But we want you just not to have to sweat that part of the platform bring up. It's just magic the SOC does. It's a minimum amount of code that's SOC memory controller specific, for example. And it should be parameterized with things like UPD, what's board specific. It's okay. The so your goal is to um, so I guess there's a lot of there's room to define uh, how this SDK will deal with the binaries and explosives. Yes, so as long as the API yeah. is maintained, the goal is you can drop in, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can drop in into one project, one platform versus other board level implementations. So if the APIs are modified or customized, you have to continue to customize it. That's not necessarily the intention is because FSP is also what we test and validate it. So you get okay. the benefit of just dropping in and it works case. So. Yeah. Cross <laughs> so one of the documents that's available is the BIOS writer's guide for each of the CPUs. Uh, what is Intel doing with regards to the FSP integration guide to describe what is being done within FSP and what actually needs to be done in the BIOS? Yes, good question, and that's part of the integration guide enhancement. Basically, what we are looking is whatever that needs to be done by bootloader, right? Whether it is core boot or EDK2 outside of FSP, we want to document that in the integration guide. So you know what exactly needs to be done, the prerequisites and what needs to be done before you call API or what needs to be done post that. Like if there is a data we pass, we need to describe what data we pass, whether using it or not using it should be a feature or an option for the bootloader. So goal is FSP integration guide may turn into the mini bias writers guide, call it, whatever we don't do inside the FSP, what needs to be done bootloader, and that needs to be publicly defined. And one of the challenges is the reset thing, right? Other than the standard hard reset, bomb reset, cold reset, uh, there are certain like custom resets we have to do for ME, handshakes, and other things. So those needs to be now defined so that bootloaders can use them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the two point, uh, I guess for boards that don't need that, um, I guess is your main thought that even if the board doesn't need to boot from MMC or might not even have that support, that you would still distribute it as, as three binaries or still be divided in to three binaries for, um, for the You can combine use. into a single binary and you can rebase into one place. Okay. And so, it's, so basically it is like, you have a flexibility, we will rebase at a single binary. So okay. we'll rebase at there. So that tool will allow you to split it and okay. you can individually rebase that if you need to place it at a different locations to optimize the flash layout. Okay. You have that flexibility and that's what the tool specially highlighted uh, in the previous slide, the okay. split FSP bin will allow you to do that. It's okay, just a so, simple Python script to just chops the binary and just rebases that. So. Okay, so distribution method will be one binary and then... And it's a one rebase use. and we'll okay. say what is default rebase. So if you can right. place it, you don't have to do anything, but uh, okay. this will allow you to do other things. Any other questions? And one other point uh, uh, is uh, we are also trying to use FSP as a default mechanism for internal use also, FSP plus EDK2, of course, in, the, in our case. Um, in that way, at least the FSP you get is already tested along with our silicon bring up and other things. Uh, as opposed to in the pro previously, we tried to do that FSP as a secondary project because we're just bringing up and the primary focus is on bringing up a silicon and which is already done in the EDK2 style. So we're trying to combine that both so we don't have to do two different things. It's the same from a silicon initialization, it's just a packaging. 
packages FSP used in EDK2, deliver it so it can be used everywhere. Is that for all chipsets, for, for the whole uh, Intel range, also for the server platform? Server is open, so um, they are not yet any official comments or anything. Uh, so I'm from client, I can speak for client. Yes, for all the future client platforms and IoT G side, whatever we produce will be based on FSP. And server side, it's basically business thing, ask customer need and demand. So. Yes. So Duncan has a request for it, and if you have a need, yeah. I think it's not like they are opposed. It's basically they're looking for a business justification and putting the resources in the right spot. So as we mentioned, it's just packaging, right? So it's not like, I mean, anybody can do that if you have access to the source. <laughs> it's just more of packaging and then supporting and doing that. So in the client side, at least, uh, we have the whole team here, Robbie, Hannah, Andre, and all. So they are engaged and supporting that. So in that server case, they need to be funded. And so. Do you have any plans to do TXT or any other proprietary security measures uh, supporting FSP? TXT room. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the Skylake, we didn't do that for all because we are doing whatever is needed for the Chromebooks, like ba basic things, what is needed. So in the KB Lake and future, right, we're trying to do a full-fledged uh, usage of FSP. That means all the features are available. You can turn on, turn off it. The negative side is the size. So we need to work on, like, do we need to slim it down if the size becomes all the features enabled? Then if you have to reduce, then we may have to do a bit which does the base certain set features and maybe a corporate version, consumer version. So that could be a different uh, based on the need, but we don't want to create multiple versions, but if that means we have to do that, we'll look into that. Yes, the TXT feature will be there uh, along with SGX and other new, techno new features and technology. 